verse 67 of Psalm 119. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. 71. It is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Now, can you, can you swallow that? Are you, are you willing to take God at his word? Verse 71 especially, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn his statutes. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 75, I know, o Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that you have, in faithfulness, you have afflicted me. Now that's even harder to swallow. But that's God's word. Heavenly Father, we have a world in affliction. We, we have a church in affliction. We have people everywhere suffering as there's never been suffering in history as far as we can see and determine. And Lord, we bring a word from heaven. We bring a word from your heart. Lord Jesus, change our, our attitudes. Change our thinking. Change our heart, Lord, concerning those things that we go through, that we may see Christ, we may see God in every circumstance in our life. Lord, let the word go forth with your unction, your anointing. Give us ears to hear what you say, Spirit. Spirit of the living God, use my vessel, use my voice, use my heart, and just speak the words to this people if you've spoken them to me. You've spoken comfort to me through these words. May we be comforted by the Holy Spirit as you move. Thank you for your presence in this house. Thank you for being with us. Now, Lord, I yield my body, my spirit, my mind, my voice to you to be a vessel to deliver this word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I don't need to explain to you what afflictions are. Those are the circumstances and the troubles that keep you awake at night, cause you to lose sleep, trying to figure out how to make your way through it, how to figure out uh, what's happening to you. And many are the afflictions of the righteous, the Bible says. But I'm convinced more than ever that God uses afflictions to heal both saint and sinner. Let's take the sinner first, and I'll give you, for example, Manasseh. One of the worst kings in the history of Israel. He was a worshiper of Baal. He established altars. He built altars right in the temple court to Baal. He, was, he sinned, the Bible said, worse than the heathen. He offered his own children in a sacrifice, casting them into the red-hot belly of Baal's idol in devil worship. He, he, was, a, he was into soothsaying. He was into fortune-telling. He, he, he would not listen to any prophet. He turned against God. He was one of the most vile tyrants in the history of Israel's, uh, Israel's kingdoms. And he shed blood, the Bible said, needlessly. A, a, a bloody tyrant. And God comes. God raises up an enemy. God raises up the Assyrians and they come. They capture Israel. They they are, are the Jerusalem and they take King Manasseh as prisoner and the captives of Jerusalem and folks when you read history and Josephus history and learn how they tortured them on their forced marches and being marched hundreds of miles through desert and and hardly any food or drink and the Bible says of this this man this evil wicked man and when he was an affliction he sought his God and humbled himself greatly before God in his affliction he turned to God he began to pray he began to intercede and the Bible said he humbled himself greatly and as a result of that he was restored to his throne and became a fighter for God tearing down the very idols that he had built and established and you may know of sinners too that are are those who, who, who seem to be the most wicked, the most vile. And folks, you can't give up on them. God has ways. God has ways through affliction to bring your loved ones. And sometimes you have to stand back in pain. 
you see a special loved one, somebody near you, you see them going through, uh, through affliction and pain, and you stand back, you can't do anything about it. But folks, if you're praying and seeking God, God could use that affliction to bring conviction and bring them to Christ. King David said his affliction came from the hand of God. The Lord in faithfulness has afflicted me. Now, folks, listen to it. Let those words sink in. I can't go any further unless you deal with this one scripture. In faithfulness, God, God, God has afflicted me. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep his word. It's a good thing for me that I was afflicted that I might learn his statutes. How did the word of God become a lamp to David's feet? How is it that he can tell the whole world, I delight in his word? How is it that he's come to this sweetness and to this prayer life and, and to have a heart after God? How has he come to this? He's had a revelation from the word of God that God was working in his life through his afflictions. Unless the law, that's the word of God, I'm reading from Psalm 119.92. Unless the law, the word, had been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. If I wasn't established in the Word, in my affliction, if I didn't allow God by His Spirit to draw me to the Word, to put His fear in my heart, if I didn't go to Him and let Him talk to me, and let Him deal with issues in my life, I would have not been, I wouldn't be here. I would have gone astray. I would have lost it. Now you can say to me that <clears throat> I can't believe that God, a loving God, could allow such troubles in my life. But I want you to listen. And, and folks, this, this is something that we have to learn. If, if we don't see God in all of our circumstances, if we don't believe that every step of a righteous man is ordered by the Lord, you'll crash. Your faith will be shipwrecked. If you don't understand that God has his hand, I'm convinced of this, that, that, that in all my circumstances, good and bad, everything that comes my way in my life, I believe that because I've committed my life to him, and I believe that the angel of the Lord camps around about them that fear him, I believe that God is ordering my steps. And sometimes it's into the flood, sometimes it's into the fire, sometimes it's into the furnace, but I know God is with me and He has a reason for everything He's doing. For you, O oh God, have proved us. You've tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our loins. We went through fire, through water, but you brought us out into a place of abundance. You see, David's not asking questions anymore. He said, I know God's doing something in me. I know that I would have backslidden. I know who I am. I know it's in my heart. And I know how God had to get my attention. David now saw God's hand in all his afflictions. He knew that his father was, was digging into his heart. He knew, in fact, Lamentations 3.33 Though God cause grief, yet he will have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. He does not afflict willingly, nor does he grieve the children of men to deprive them of their cause. I want you to hear this in the spirit. You see, God gets no delight, he says, in the death of, of the sinner. He doesn't get any delight about sinners being damned. That's not his delight. And now Jeremiah and Lamentations said this is God's unwilling work. He doesn't do it willingly. In fact, in the Hebrew it means without heart. He said, God, this is not... He, he, has, he does this unwillingly. His heart is not in it. My, I, I, I grew up uh, in early Pentecost and it, back in those days they took the Word of God literally. Uh, spare the rod and damn the child. You know, apply the rod. And my father had a leather belt hanging on a nail going down to the basement. And when I did wrong and 
I was just like every boy and more so. And I, I know my preacher dad loved me, but when I failed, he would take me into his room and set me down and explain what I did wrong. And he said, now, David, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurt you. But I never believed it. But my father would apply the belt. He would apply it to my heart. I mean, to my backside. And my heart. But you see, the hardest part was not the spanking. Now, they call that child abuse now. God has so made the human body, there's a place for spanking very lightly. I'm not trying to be facetious, but folks, the hardest part was all when my father said, Come here, David. And he'd put his arms around me. And say, I love you. And, and that's probably one of the reasons I'm here tonight, this morning, preaching the gospel. Picture the surgeon who is in the operating room and the staff is preparing for the operation. And there's a child laying on the operating table who has cancer and has been diagnosed as malignant. And the surgeon stands over that child and he's about to cut. And he knows he's going to inflict pain, but there's a tear in his eye because you see that child is his. And that makes all the difference that there's a loving father and when he has to uh, when he has to allow affliction in our life it's because he's trying to remove the cancer he's trying to remove that which is in our hearts that would destroy us when affliction comes our way the first thing we're apt to do is blame the devil we we talk about satanic attacks now now folks we we can talk to you about job and Job was afflicted by Satan, but he had to have permission. God had to take down the protecting wall that was around Job. We talk about spiritual warfare. We talk about the devil goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom may, he may destroy. We know that Paul was buffeted by a messenger from Satan. We know that Paul at times was hindered by the enemy, hindered by Satan in going a certain place. But I want you to know, friends, listen closely. I, I have said that time and time again. I'm under satanic attack. This is, a, this is the devil at work trying to destroy me. I've said that many times. But I, I want you to just follow me in the scripture for just a moment. There's no way, not any of, these, any of this that I've mentioned, not any of this. Yes, the devil, the devil can do the attacking, but he can't touch a child of God without permission. He cannot touch you. He cannot afflict you. He, he cannot change you. Let me talk to you. Let me give you the scripture. Psalm 89, 20. 20 God said, I have found David. I anointed him with my holy oil. My hand and my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not deceive him. The son of wickedness shall not afflict him. The son of wickedness can't touch. I found David. I found this man. This, this is my child. This is David, my son. And I've got a strong arm to protect him. And I'm pronouncing to the whole world that the enemy, Satan, cannot afflict him. He cannot afflict him without permission. Satan shall not afflict him. In Zechariah, the third chapter. And the Lord said unto Satan, Satan came to stand before God with, with the brethren, or with the saints, to accuse them before the Father. And God said, Zechariah, third chapter, And the Lord said to the devil, or to Satan, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Now folks, I want to tell you what I believe. I believe with all my heart. Before the devil can touch you as a child of God, before the enemy can afflict or do any damage to it at all. He has to go to the throne of God. 
And he has to stand between, right before Christ. And there's the Heavenly Father. Now he has to bring a greater argument than the blood of Jesus Christ. He has to have something on you. He has to have something that is greater than the blood of Jesus. And there's nothing conceivable to the mind of man that is greater than the blood of Jesus Christ. He cannot break the bloodline. As the mountains are around Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about the people from now and forevermore. The rod of the wicked shall not rest upon thee, lest the righteous put forth their hands to iniquity. The rod of the wicked or the rod of Satan cannot be put on the back of God's people. Now folks, I, I have said and we, we, we said this is of the devil and these, there, are, there are attacks from the devil. There is a messenger that was allowed to go and buffet Paul. And we know it's in the flesh. Now, folks, I'm not, I, I would have to condemn 50 years of preaching uh, about this if, if I didn't, if, if I came to a conclusion suddenly in my final day, in my older days, at my old age, some new doctrine. No, there are attacks. There are attacks. But there, they, there has to be permission and it has to be something that God knows that just as the king of Assyria was used as, as God's rod of affliction, he can only be used and he can only be used for a time and he cannot touch, he cannot kill you, he cannot destroy you. This was the limitations put on the devil when he came to afflict Job. Yes, you can touch him, but folks, Paul the Apostle said, I prayed three times that God would release me from this messenger of Satan. Now that was from the devil. So he is afflicted. This is a messenger from Satan. But God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace will let you in, not only endure but stand strong. And he acknowledges it's because I was a man of pride. I had visions that if I told them, if I testified about them, would make me a very proud man and, and could have destroyed me. And God was saving a man that he loved, allowing this affliction. <clears throat> There's another response to afflictions, and it's this. I'm being afflicted because I'm paying for my past sins. And then suddenly we repay all those sins that we have committed in the past. And then we set them up against, we, we put them as a standard up against the affliction we have and say, well, I can't understand this. I fasted, I prayed, I've done everything that a Christian should do, and I'm still under affliction. And it has to be because God, I must have crossed the line somewhere. I, I must have sinned so much against light. I must have done something so terrible in the eyes of God that he's having to, he's having to afflict me. He's having, he's allowed this in my life because of some hideous thing and, and th those things will be brought to memory. There's an example of that in the scripture, <clears throat> in the life of Asaph. Asaph was music director and choir director in the temple under the reign of David and Solomon, both. And he was a praying man, he was a godly man, he was a trusting man. But there came a great affliction into his life. And he, 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 he says in Psalm 77, and it's all in Psalm 77, he said, I am so troubled that I can't speak. There was an affliction that came into Asaph's life, godly man. And he said, it was so overwhelming, he gives us no details, but he said, it, 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 it was so overwhelming, he says, I am so troubled, I am so troubled I can't speak. And then, then you can hear him in the 77th Psalm. You hear him saying, I stretched out my hands to my God. I, I stretched out my hand, but there was no answer. He said, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. In chapter 73, he says, God is good to those who have a clean heart. God's good to those who have a clean heart. In other words, uh, you have to be good to avoid affliction, which is a wrong doctrine. All our goodness in the world doesn't keep us from affliction. Then he goes on. But for me, 
My feet have almost, my feet were almost gone, and my feet almost stumbled. He said, I almost crashed. I almost backslid because I was envious. And then he looked around and he saw the prosperity. He was envious at those who were prospering and those who didn't seem to have a problem in life and were not afflicted as far as he could see. And something rose up in his heart and he, he, he says, I, I have fasted, I have prayed, I've cleaned my hands, I've, I've sought to... And if you'll read the 73rd chapter, you'll find it all there. And he said, I've, I've struggled to be pure and walk righteously before the Lord and all I get are afflictions. And there was a jealousy that came into his heart and then he, the only conclusion, and he, he lets us in on the cause of his troubled heart. He, he, he said, I don't understand this. I don't understand why I'm not being blessed when all around me ungodly people are being blessed. And he said, it's because it's sin. And you see, there was a problem in his life. He was envious, and that envy could have destroyed him. There's nothing more danger, no more serious or crippling than envy and jealousy. And it could have destroyed him. God loved this man. God would not let him go. And you see, when you're in this kind of situation, when, when you uh, are struggling with thoughts from the enemy and from the flesh that God is allowing some hardship in your life because you've been such a dirty, filthy sinner and even though you've been serving the Lord, you still slip, you still go back and you failed. And so now God's getting even with me. No, no, no. Hear it well, because you see, you come then at this place to what I call trial by the word. Until Joseph's time came, the, the word of the Lord tried him, tested him. And you see, we're, we always tell people, and I, I preach this, and you hear that when you're in trouble, go back to the Red Sea, go back to the manna, go back to the water out of the rock. And look at all the miracles God did in the past. Well, he did that. He did that in chapter 77. He went back. To Israel, he went back to the opening of the Red Sea. He went back to the miracles, the the cloud and the manna and the water out of the rock and the healing of bitter waters. And he only got worse for him. You see, when you're being tried by the Word of God, you can go back. You can go back and you can look at all the miracles, but it's going to take more than just looking back. Because he said, I remembered God and I became troubled. I remembered all the miracles. And you see, why is he feeling troubled after looking at the miracles and doing what we're supposed to do? He said, because I don't see that in my life. I don't see my Red Sea opening. I don't see water out of my rock. And see, we're tried by the Word of God. It'll try you. And folks, if you stay there, you can shipwreck your faith. If you try to figure it out, no. Because you see, yes, go back. Remember the good things God has done. But you hold on to your faith. God is with you in your trial. Now, let me give you a statement. I want you to remember it. God is not with me uh, in spite, in spite of my failures, my sins, my slothfulness. He's not with me in spite of it. He's with me in my struggles. He's with me in my pain. He's with me in my failure. He never leaves. He never forsakes. He is still there. And that's the lesson. And Asaph finally learned that and God brought him out to a glorious victory. Hallelujah. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ who died. Yes, brother, he is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Scripture says, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. There is now therefore no condemnation to them that be in Christ Jesus, who walk at the Spirit and not the flesh. No condemnation to those who be in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah.